Ah, coño, yo lo, lo tengo 10 minutos. Estamos en vivo. Estamos en vivo y estamos ya con tres nuevos productos que acaba de lanzar Blackmagic. ATEM M1-4K, ATEM 4K también el M2 y lo que estamos viendo ahora, lo que estamos viendo ahora es el nuevo micro panel. Vamos a escuchar, a ver. Ahí está conectando el micropanel al software control. Y lo que hace es replicar todos los botones para tener un panel ahora mucho más accesible. Chicos, estamos en vivo desde la tienda de Miami. Estamos viendo los nuevos productos. 675 dólares el nuevo micropanel. Es un producto que todos estábamos esperando, todos los que nos gusta trabajar con los botones y no con el software. Esto va a replicar de una forma mucho más económica lo que teníamos antes, los paneles grandes que eran un poco más Ah, que estamos en vivo. Ahora, switches are very affordable. dólares dólares So it has to be simple to use. And I think if we can fix okay, these problems, es everybody can benefit. IP so let's first talk about the cost issue. Now, we recently introduced the product Digo, called Blackmagic 2110 IP Converter 3.3G. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it has yes. three channels of HD video. Una uh, now, it uses standard 10G Ethernet cables, muy duro, muy duro, like 6G, um, Black Cat 6 para cables, sorry. And Cat 6 cables are very cheap. 10G Ethernet switches are cheap. Uh, 10G Ethernet actually also supports power and Ethernet. Uh, but 10G Ethernet's already very common, and also 10G Ethernet um, It's just so available. So I think using 10G, that's a really good idea. But what about Ultra HD? You know, to do Ultra HD, we'd have to go to 25 gigabit Ethernet, and that's optical fiber only, and that would be very costly. So what we really want to do is do Ultra HD down a 10G Ethernet cable. And we already know this works great for HD, and it also works great for Ultra HD at 30 frames a second. And under. So what about the high frame at Ultra HD? So to do that, we need to use some video compression. And we didn't want to use an off-the-shelf uh, codec for this because they have really high licenses fees and they've also got a lot of latency. And latency is a big problem uh, for live production. And these off-the-shelf codecs are very complex. They take up a lot of space inside the product. So it drives up the product. Cost. And we've sold menos latencia, that. We've menos new lightweight data reduction code. It's called Black Magic IP. A través de un cable It's de extremely red. simple. It has very light compression, almost none. I mean, we're only trying to fit 12 GSDI into a 10G Ethernet cable. So 
We don't need very much compression. Uh, plus it's a very small design. It's only about 1 20th the size of a regular codec. And it doesn't use any weird technical tricks like modern technical tricks, which means it can be an open standard. So there's no licensing cost. And we're gonna publish this design in our manual so anyone can use it. Really any FPGA designer will be able to make this codec. Um, and it doesn't take up much space in the product. Uh, so the product's a lower cost. It also means that regular 10G Ethernet cables can now do high frame at Ultra HD. And then we can design smaller products such as mini converters. Okay, so now let's talk about the next problem, which is complexity. Fix that. Well, the easiest way to do that is design products to work point to point. If we make a converter for each end, then you just connect them and all the configuration's automatic. Like for example, you can just connect cameras to switches, connect them to direct, direct, there's no settings. Um, we just have to design the converters we need to be able to work on both ends of the cable. Um, and so we've been working on that. Um, but there's another big advantage, I think, of um, using CAT6 cables for 2110, like 10G Ethernet cables, is we can power the remote devices. Um, so the studio can like power a camera, for example. Um, and that means you only have one cable uh, and remote devices don't need any local power, which can be a huge advantage for live production. So I think it's really exciting if we can address those issues. Um, so even though we want the products to be low cost and simple, they still do need to be SMPTE 2110 IP products. Um, you can use them in complex broadcast systems and they support the full 2110 standard, like the PTP clock. They support multicast, NMOS routing, they're 10-bit, and they support SD, HD, and Ultra HD. So what I wanted to do is uh, show you some of the products that we've designed. Uh, and each product has been designed for a specific task. Uh, so let me, well, let's talk about the camera and monitoring side first. Um, so a very common need is for monitoring. Um, for that, we have a new uh, Blackmagic 2110 IP Mini, uh, Blackmagic 2110 IP Mini high HDMI. Now, what it allows you to do is uh, monitor 2110 video on any HDMI TV or monitor. So let me bring the product up. Here it is here. So you can see it's nice and small, so you can mount it behind a TV. Um, there's the HDMI side there, if you can get a shot of that. Um, now, it supports all HD and Ultra HD standards up to 2160p60. And uh, it has a 10G RJ45 Ethernet cable, which I'll show on the other side there. Now, it powers from the 10G Ethernet, but it actually includes a DC power supply as well. Now, it's a true SMPTE 2110 device. It'll work on large 2110 systems, but there's, and there's a utility for Mac and Windows that lets you configure all those 2110 IP settings. Um, so all the settings are automatic, though, if you connect it direct. Um, so it's a tiny converter that's very powerful. It works on big systems as well as just being plugged point to point. Uh, so I think this is a really great low-cost solution for uh, 2110 monitoring. Now, the new Blackmagic 2110 IP Mini IP to HDMI will be priced at $295. It'll be available in May. Now, another big need is live cameras. So we've designed an SDI model that's perfectly designed for cameras, although it works with any SDI gear, really. Uh, now, this model's called Blackmagic 2110 IP Mini by Direct 12G. So let me show you. I'll bring it out. Um, first, let me get rid of this. Get this out of the way. Here it is there. Um, so as the name says, it's bi-directional. Um, so I can show you the 10G Ethernet there. So it connects, uh, to, it basically converts 12G SDI to 2110, uh, which can be used for like a camera feed, but at the same time, it converts from 2110 to 12G SDI, which could be a program return. Um, if it's used with an ATM switcher, then it, all that control information would go back through the program return on the SDI output. And yeah, the control stuff includes tally, camera control, lens control, and talkback. Now it's 12G SDI for all HD and Ultra HD video standards up to 2160p60. It has the low cost um, RJ45 10G Ethernet. It powers from 10G Ethernet as well, but it includes the DC power supply. And it's so small, you can mount it beside a camera. Uh, but what's really fun about this product is it includes a five pin XLR talkback connector. Now a lot of SDI cameras don't have talkback, so we thought it'd be really nice to add that. Um, so it works with any, you can see the connector there, if I can get a shot of that. It works with any standard broadcast talkback headset. And also it has talkback controls. So if you look down there, you can see there's talkback headset volume controls and a push to talk button. So it's pretty cool. Um, so it really has everything you need for a camera. Now, this new model, make sure I don't put it upside down. This new model, the Blackmagic, is called the Blackmagic 2110 IP Mini by Direct 12G, and it'll be priced at $365. And that'll be available in May. Okay, so the next live production problem we want to solve is handling presenters. You know, like when a presenter is giving a todo, todo talk to an la, audience, el, they often have a computer with slides on it, and that de, is often, de, of, de often connected to a projector. Well, actually, it has to be connected to a projector. They also have microphones locally on the podium. So we wanted to have a solution for this. It's called the Blackmagic 2110 IP Presentation Converter. Let me show you. I'll bring it out. Uh, let me just make some space here. 
Here it is. Now it's quite different to our normal converters because it's kind of a bundle of different conversions all in the one design. But for presenters, they kind of need all these. Um, so the front's similar to our Eternix mini converters, but you, know, you have the LCD for the settings. Plus there's a headphone connection and speaker. Um, but we'll have a look at the back. That's where it gets really interesting. Uh, you can see there. Now there's a HDMI input to connect to the computer and it looks like a second monitor to the computer. Um, now there's actually a standards converter on the input to that, so you don't have to worry about what the computer settings are. The HDMI will just convert the video coming in and send it out. Um, so people can just walk up and plug their laptop in. Uh, but next to that you'll notice we have a USB-C connection. That's actually also a video input. It's basically like having a USB to HDMI adapter built into the converter. So you just plug in the USB and um, you get video connection. And what's really good too is that the USB will charge your computer. So you don't have to worry about any of the battery running low on the computer. You get both video and power from the uh, converter and all in that single USB-C connection. Now we also have a HDMI output, that's for the projector. So the presenter's slides can be sent up through the converter up to the projector. Uh, but some projectors don't handle all the video standards. Some of them are pretty crappy if they've been installed for a while. So we have a second standards converter on the HDMI video output so it'll make sure that the um, projector's happy. Uh, so whatever the projector needs, this converter will just convert it and provide that. You'll also notice on the back there's a 12G SDI output. That's great if you want to feed a regular switcher with the SDI video from this converter. But we also have the SMPTE 2110 IP video connection on there. Now this converter can be powered from the 10G Ethernet connection. Even when there's a USB computer connected, it powers both the converter and the laptop. So that's pretty nice. And another powerful feature of 2110 IP is it's, um, the Ethernet connection is bidirectional. So what this actually means is you can switch the HDMI output and the 12G SDI output to be a return feed coming into, this, um, into the converter from the IP input, not the local HDMI or USB input. Now this is really nice because it means you can run a projector from the switcher output and the switcher output uh, operator can decide what feeds the projector. Often it would be the computer being fed back, but if they're unplugging the computer like that. So I think that's a really powerful uh, feature of 2110 IP video. Now we also have some XLR audio outputs if you want to feed like a local PA speakers from the switcher because the switchers have powerful audio. Plus there's actually some XLR microphone inputs and they have fan and power and they're for local microphones. So you can see this has a lot of features. It's so flexible. Um, so, that, uh, so I think it's a really great uh, solution uh, for all types of presenter needs. Yeah. It's a whole lot of different conversions all in there that really solve that problem specifically or all the problems you have with the presenters. Now the new Blackmagic 2110 IP presentation converter will be priced at $845. Wow. So it'll also be available in May. So next we have a four channel rack converter. And this can be used to add like 2110 IP channels to an ATEM switcher. Uh, like we've got one on the rack over here. Now it's called, this new model is called Blackmagic 2110 IP converter 4 times 12 g I'll bring it out. Um, now as I was saying, we've got one over in the rack here, but sí, here's one here. Just, uh, ahora, vamos a verlos, um, eh, el so this will convert Uh, well, en realidad toda la próxima semana en el stand de Blackmagic le vamos a traer más detalles qué es lo que pueden hacer so con esto ahora hemos visto so todo en función del nuevo sistema 2110IP que lo lanzaron el año pasado y han desarrollado cuatro o cinco nuevos productos hasta ahora el presentation cuatro canales de IP y el presentation está bien interesante es un controlador que lo podemos poner donde está el, el, el que va a hablar el que está haciendo el discurso con la computadora y podemos interactuar con todo lo que él tiene en vivo ¿no? So, so está bien interesante like for, um, este nuevo tecnología que están, que están presentando Now what that allows you to do is if you don't have any inputs in the individual inputs and you can plug one return video feed into the bottom connector and it'll feed all the cameras. So it's pretty cool. It's actually like four of our studio converters in a single rack unit. So this new Blackmagic 2110 IP converter, four times 12G will be priced at 1995. As with all these prices, they can change depending on government duties and taxes. Now let me just put this down here. Position that nicely there. Alrighty, so, and this uh, converter will be available in June. Um, so now productos. I want to talk about some solutions we have for optical fiber. Obviously, if you want to run long distances, you need to use optical fiber. Now, these models have SFP sockets for optical fiber uh, adapters. So you can add an optical fiber module that you want to put in there. Now, you can't power them over optical fiber because that doesn't work. But one thing we have done with our products, so our IP video products will also work with 3G, um, 6G and 12G SDI optical modules optical SDI, depending on what you want to do. So we have three optical models. Now they're actually the same as the other converters I've just shown you. Um, however, uh, the rack converter that we have is eight channels because we don't need to 
power external converters, we have more space to put eight channels. So it's actually eight converters in one. Now this model is called the Blackmagic 2110IP converter, eight times 12G um, SFP. Uh, like the four channel model, it's uh, bi-directional. It has eight um, SFP Ethernet sockets. Um, and so it also has the eight 12G SDI inputs and the single uh, 12G SDI uh, program input as well. So it's really nice. Um, so this eight channel rack converter will be priced at uh, 2595. Um, we also have a 2110IP HDMI converter, like this one here. It's also exactly the same, but the Ethernet's an SFP optical socket, uh, so you can put the modules in, and it'll be priced at $2.95. And we also have a version of the SDI converter here with an SFP uh, socket for optical fiber, uh, so it's bi-directional 12G SDI, and that'll be priced at uh, $3.65. So they're exactly the same, apart from the Ethernet being different. Now all these optical models will be available around June, um, and there'll be details of all the different models here because we don't have a lot of time. The details about all these models will be on our website. So next I wanted to talk about monitoring. Um, now we have a SmartView 4K rack monitor. It's very popular, but we thought it'd be good to add SMPTE 2110 into it. And then it'd be able to handle both SMPTE 2110 and 12G SDI video. So the new model's called SmartView 4K G3. It's the third generation of the rack monitor. Uh, I don't really have the space to bring one out here, but I do have one over in the rack over there if you can get a shot of that. Um, I have some slides as well, so I can show you the back of it. Antes, and it's very similar to the old model. Um, obviously, it's full Ultra HD resolution screen. But now it has the SMPTE 2110 RP input. Now, it actually has an RJ45 socket Ahora, and a SFP socket for 10G no Ethernet. So I can do both optical eh, and optical uh, cables. Transmission it has two 12G SDI red, inputs like the older model had. Eh, and it has the 12G SDI loop out. And that SDI output actually will switch video out from either the SDI input or the 2110 input. It handles SD, HD and Ultra HD. Um, and it has an internal power supply, it actually has both AC and DC connections, and the DC connection provides the redundancy. It's the same machine to metal design, uh, but now it's actually in a deep black colour, so it matches the other products. It's really nice. It's had six rack units, um, it has the control buttons along the bottom, and it has the screen overlays. It actually runs Blackmagic OS now, and it also still has the 3D lookup tables. So I think it's a really nice new model. Now the new SmartView 4K G3 will be priced at 1265 So that's the same price as the previous model. So now you get SMPTE 2110, IP input at no extra charge. So that'll be shipping in a few weeks. So next up is audio monitoring. Sí, um, we also precio, thought it'd be nice to have audio monitoring with 2110 built in. Uh, so the like audio monitor is a really nice audio monitor. It's one rack unit in size with great audio. Um, so now we've got a new model that adds SMPTE 2110 input. It's called Blackmagic Audio Monitor 12G G3. It's also the third generation of the audio monitor. I have one, uh, in the rack over there, de audio of course, I've got of that, but I've also got one here, it's a wonderful design. Se le agrega también um, el IP2110 para front, but now recibir la información. It's got that large audio meter and the headphone socket on the front. It's got fantastic big sound for a one rack unit. Really powerful amp, dual subwoofers, all digital processing. Este es un producto bien interesante que really accurate ballistics. Um, each no es muy conocido, pero es muy bueno como monitor de campo y tiene, como ven ahí, cuatro parlantes y funciona en los racks de 19 pulgadas. Um, so it's obviously still got the advanced 12G SDI input and supports SMPTE 2110 now. So it's compatible with SD, HD and Ultra HD video sources. And it even supports the NMOS stand and other SMPTE 2110 protocols. But it also connects to analog. So it's got the bounced XLR analog audio input, the ASCBU XLR digital audio input, the RCA Hi-Fi analog input. So it's got a lot of stuff and it's got obviously the built-in power. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, so I think this will be a really great model. I'll put it down here and uh, so it's got such amazing sound in one rack unit. It connects to everything and it's got an amazing audio meter. So the new Blackmagic Audio Monitor 12G G3, we priced it 1295. So I'll just put this under the presentation converter. So stack them up. Es muy similar al precio so que tenía el rack anterior de, de audio. It's the same as the old model. So el mismo precio. And it looks so nice in the black there. You can see it matches the other, the other products beautifully. Um, and those illuminated meter segments really burst Me imagino que todos están esperando lo mismo que nosotros, una nueva cámara que incluía también la tecnología IP2110. So one uh, product we don't have to update is the Blackmagic Studio Camera Pro. Now we designed these with 10G Ethernet built in. So we already, you know, we already connect them to the Blackmagic Studio Converter and that single cable already does the remote power, the tally, the talkback, the camera control and all the video to and from the camera, all with a single 10G Ethernet cable. So we're, what we're doing is we're working on a software update to turn the camera into a 2110 IP device. 
then the camera will be basically native uh, 2110. It'll be a native 2110 studio camera. Uh, it'll work with all the products I've announced here. Um, you'll be able to connect up to four cameras for this rack converter, so it'll be really cool. Now, the software update for the cameras will be free of charge, and they'll work on any Blackmagic wow. Studio camera 4K Pro or 6K Pro. Las cámaras solamente van a tener una actualización y ya van a poder usar esta tecnología. Está muy bien. Eso. Esta es una tecnología que va a ser transformada en una tecnología de 2110 IP. Así que estos softwares deben ser disponibles en un par de semanas. Así que ten un ojo para eso. Pero hay otra cosa que estamos haciendo. Vamos a actualizar los cámaras de SMT5 que usamos en nuestras cámaras de broadcast. El cámara de SMT5 tiene 10G que está en el lado, lo que significa que podemos hacer que soporte 2110, SMT 2110, con ese convertor. So you basically get a high-end studio camera that's got 2110 native IP built into it. So I think that'll be really fantastic for high-end broadcasters. And that update will also be included in a camera update due in a few weeks. So I'd keep an eye out for that so you can upgrade your cameras. Um, so next up, um, these products are all point to point and they make 2110 easy. Uh, but what happens if you do want to build a more complex system? Yeah, you kind of got to deal with complex configurations, which kind of IT teams understand, but most other people don't. So we thought we could um, uh, have a, we had an interesting idea where we could solve this problem. So what we've done is we've built an Ethernet switch designed for 2010 IP video, but it's designed for the TV industry. So it's, it's basically got a simple router control panel on the front. So it looks like a video product, but it's actually an Ethernet switch. So it's in the rack here, um, just down there. Now I've got a couple of slides. You can see what the front panel looks like. Um, it looks like exactly like a video router. Uh, and the back panel looks like an Ethernet switch. So it's pretty cool. Now it's designed for television. So all the connections on the, on the back because all the rest of the gear, the connection's on the back. Um, so it's like, it matches all the other gear. It's much better for cable management. I mean, yeah, we want our connections on the back of the products, not on the front. Um, that's where they should be. Now, the, as far as connections go, it's got 16 10G Ethernet ports, and it's also got 200G Ethernet ports. So it's pretty powerful. Um, so it's really good for small 2110 IP systems. Um, you don't need an IT team. Uh, team. The control panel's built in. It does all the multicast settings, basically by a router panel. Uh, so you get a whole bunch of dynamic labels that appear um, whenever a 2110 device is connected, and they're all displayed in alphabetical order on the front screen. So let me go over to the rack and I'll show you how this works. So if you can sort of just track over as I walk over. So we've got one Vamos here. Vamos a rack, el nuevo switcher. So you can see the front panel there, no, so it's really no, easy to use. No teníamos switcher de, de, de red. The route. There it is, so it's exactly the same para as Para hacer a, todas las conexiones RJ, pero ahorita acaban de lanzar un Ethernet yeah, switch. Ah, so it's really cool. Also, Con la tecnología. So it's been upgraded to support NMOS. So I can also route with that. And you can see they actually followed. So if I change this, you'll see the smart controller change. So it's really cool. Now let's talk about monitoring. Um, status is actually quite important for monitoring, uh, for television, sorry. And so you want to really see what's going on. So we have a great monitoring output of this um, Ethernet switch. Let me show you that. So I've got it uh, connected up into the B input of this display here. So you see there. Um, now each connection has a speed graph on the monitor output. So it's really easy to see what's going on. And the graph shows all the data activity and the speed connections. You can also see the 2110 uh, device names on each port if it's a 2110 device connected. So I kind of think that's a really nice feature. It's pretty cool. Like as you switch, you can see the different video changing. You can see as I'm changing into the monitor claro, there. It's switch. really cool. Es un switch que va a estar diseñado para el IP2110 donde le podemos monitorear los datos. Podemos hasta ponerle los nombres a cada entrada, pero obviamente es para la tecnología 2110. Es muy bueno para flyway kits o small broadcast trucks. Ahora, este nuevo Blackmagic Ethernet Switch 360P, que es su nombre, va a ser precio de 2895. Así que estará disponible en julio. So I think we have a really great range of SMT2110 IP video products now. We've got cameras, Para converters, Julio. Ethernet switch, video monitoring, audio monitoring. And then with the upgrades, the cameras will support 2110. So I think that's really nice because people can use the cameras they already have because uh, they'll be converted to 2110. So it's great. Sí. Okay, so next up, I want to talk about the o sea, Podemos usar 19. las cámaras so que ya really tenemos con salida uh, Ethernet para se actualizan próximamente uh, y podemos usar el mismo sistema de 2110.
DaVinci Resolve 19 introduces a tremendous number of new features, including AI-based tools for tracking, noise reduction, and audio effects, text-based timeline editing, the color slice vector grading palette, the film look creator effect, and the Fusion U volume tool for advanced smoke, flames, and explosion VFX. Let's get started. In the edit page, you can now use audio transcription to directly edit the timeline, detect multiple speakers, and replace text. To begin, right-click a clip in the media pool, navigate to audio transcription, choose speaker detection, and then press transcribe. In the transcription window, you'll see text assigned to various speakers as well as timestamps. Click to change the speaker names and reassign dialog lines as needed. Select sections of text and hit delete to remove associated video and audio in the timeline. Perform full or partial term searches and select replace to correct text. A trim editor is now available in the edit page. Double click an edit point or choose trim editor from the trim menu to activate it. Drag or use the comma and period keys to refine your edits and transitions while observing frame count and placement of neighboring clips. Click outside the interface to exit. The edit page now the offers a fixed playhead option in found in the Timeline View Options menu on point. the left side of the toolbar. Trim editor from the trim With this configuration, <laughs> the playhead remains static <laughs> while the timeline moves during playback. This can mean less zooming and horizontal navigation and when editing. You can now use your numeric keypad to directly enter timecode values for the timeline or viewer. Use plus and minus symbols to navigate up and down the timeline, or select clips and add or subtract values to move and trim them. The Inspector's File tab now features a streamlined way of handling audio file properties and skimming audio channels so you don't need to open the clip attributes. The Color page introduces another groundbreaking tool, Color Slice. This grading palette allows you to adjust properties of the conventional six vectors of an image, red, green, and blue, cyan, magenta, and yellow, plus a dedicated skin vector. You can adjust the density, saturation, and hue of each vector. Saturation uses a subtractive mode, affecting midtones and shadows more than highlights. This allows you to achieve deep, filmic looks. Click the highlight icon in the upper left to preview the vector's key. Use the center slider to adjust the position of the vector slice relative to the color wheel. Adjustment controls across the top of the palette allow you to make changes to the image on a global level. The new IntelliTrack option in the trackers palette uses DaVinci Neural Engine AI to achieve incredible tracking performance. In the tracker palette, choose IntelliTrack, add tracker points to the image, and move them to trackable areas of the frame. Use the tracker toolbar controls to track effects or stabilize an image. In the Motion Effects palette, the Spatial Noise Reduction tool has a new DaVinci Neural Engine-driven mode, Ultra NR. When you click Analyze, the Luma and Chroma threshold parameters will automatically adjust to best reduce noise based on the sample area. You can resize and reposition the sample area in the viewer to instantly update the threshold parameters and optimally remove digital noise from your image. The new Node Stack feature allows you to break up your overall node graph into separate layers while maintaining a single video pipeline. It's the perfect solution to grades with complex node structures. To activate Node Stack, open Project Settings, go to General Options, and in the Color section, choose the amount of Node Stack layers. You can choose up to four layers and customize their labels. Node Stack layers will now be available to all clips in the project. Use the drop-down menu or the dots above the node graph to navigate between the layers. This feature can be combined with versions and group workflows. Clip graph layers are applied sequentially when transferred between stills or clips. Right-click on a thumbnail and select Apply Active Layer to transfer node graphs to one layer at a time. Other great actions like rippling and resetting can also be done on a per-layer basis. When working in the RGB Mixer palette, you now have the option to normalize channels as you adjust them. This means that the luminance of the image will remain constant, giving you some aesthetically pleasing split tone effects. In the Effects panel, the new Film Look Creator allows you to design cinematic looks through the use of film emulation grading techniques and effects. To begin, drag the Film Look Creator effect onto a node. You will immediately see an underlying film look driven by over 60 internal parameters. As it's scene-driven, it will work with any type of footage as long as it's correctly color-managed. You can choose a preset at the top to get started. Use the blend controls to adjust the strength of the underlying color look and spatial film effects. Photometrically set exposure, 
S-curve contrast and highlights, and fade the shadows and black point of the image. The white balance and tint use chromatic adaptation to realistically shift a scene's light source. Use the skin bias parameter if the previous settings have oversaturated or unbalanced the skin. Subtractive saturation, richness, and bleach bypass offer different ways of adjusting image saturation, while split tone adds opposing color hues to the highlights and shadows of the image. The remaining internal effects imitate the physical aspects of film, affect light source halation and bloom, introduce grain texture, and add motion with flicker and gate weave. Defocus background is a DaVinci neural engine effect that uses AI to simulate shallow depth of field in a shot. To begin, generate a mask of your foreground. You can do this within the same node or in a separate node, which you'll connect to the defocus background key input. Control blur amount, saturation, and even color to make your foreground subject pop. The face refinement tool has undergone some major improvements to its tracking and feature controls. It can now detect multiple subjects, allows you to fine-tune track points and interpolate keyframes, and offers more facial feature adjustment options. On the Deliver page, you can now disable specific video tracks when setting up a render job. You can now restore backups of deleted timelines. Click the Options menu in the Media Pool and choose Deleted Timeline Backups. USD tools on the Fusion page have received several updates. The new U-Texture, U-Texture Transform, U normal map and U shader nodes give you the ability to import and manipulate textures directly in your USD scene without having to wrap them in a USD file first. These tools add flexibility and control to your USD workflow within the Fusion page. And now Fusion lets you more easily render realistic or stylized smoke, flames, and explosions using the new U volume tool. This lets you directly load volumetric VDB files and easily control shading and field mapping. The new multi-poly tool makes rotoscoping more efficient by allowing you to create multiple masks in a single node. The list of polygon shapes in the inspector allows you to easily modify, organize, and animate shapes through one simple interface. The shape tools have received several updates. The new S-Text node allows you to add text directly into your shape-based node trees, and the new S-B-Spline node allows you to create B-Spline-based shapes. Also, all shapes now support animation motion paths, and the Shape Tool Style tab now includes opacity controls. The Fusion Tracker now defaults to using IntelliTrack, the new DaVinci Neural Engine Tracker. Using AI makes tracking easier and more precise, especially when tracking many points. DaVinci Resolve 19 introduces a powerful new way of applying Fusion compositions to your clips called Referenced Composition. This method allows you to reuse your work across multiple clips or even timelines. You create a referenced composition on the edit page by selecting a single clip or a stack of clips, and then select Create Referenced Composition from the contextual menu. This generates a Fusion referenced composition in the media pool. You can enter the Fusion page to start compositing 19. in the media applied across all connected clips because they are all referred or linked to the same composition. Reference compositions are an effective and secure way to keep your work backed up and organized, as they live in the media pool and will persist even if the original reference clip is deleted from the timeline. With DaVinci Resolve 19, the Fusion page has also received several other important updates, such as support for OpenColor I.O. 2.3, support for additional view LUT options and display transforms, and the already powerful Text Plus node has received additional on-screen controls that are available both on the Fusion page and on the edit page in Fusion Overlay mode. The Fairlight page has exciting new features and effects that enhance your creativity and save you time. Let's start in the Inspector, where you'll find three new AI-based track effects. Music Remixer is an AI plugin that lets you remix music tracks to fit your show. Start by enabling the Music Remixer on a track containing music. Open the controls and adjust levels for vocals, drums, bass, guitar, and other sources. You can change a vocal song into an instrumental track with a single click. Remix the different instrument levels and even automate changes over time. Dialogue Separator uses AI to give you independent level controls for dialogue, background sounds, and ambience, so you can refocus recorded dialogue and lower the background sounds while preserving the reverberant field of the room. 
When you vote Jamie Woods, you vote a real leader. I remember birthdays. Puedo hablar. Or decreasing the excessive ambience while adjusting background sounds as needed over time. Lo que acaban de ver es, la, estamos viendo hace rato la nueva actualización de DaVinci 19. Los que ya tienen DaVinci 18 pueden bajar DaVinci 19. Lo que estamos viendo es la parte de audio, que está impresionante. The Ducker makes it easy to get a good mix automatically by using the levels of one track to manage the levels of another track without the need for keyframes or automation. In this scene, the music track is overpowering the dialogue. Just enable the Ducker on the music track and choose the dialogue as the source track. Then adjust the amount that you want the music to lower. Well, Use the controls to adjust the duck level and response time. Will you teach me how to surf? The real-time waveform display shows the level changes in the music whenever dialogue appears as the source track. All the track effects are available in the mixer and the inspector for the selected track. To choose which track effects are visible in the mixer, use the Mixer Options menu. Completely unique to DaVinci Resolve, you can now do AI-based audio panning in the Fairlight Viewer using IntelliTrack. You can automatically track people or objects and generate precise pan automation. To track an object, mark a range in the timeline and select the track. You'll find the tracker controls in the Fairlight Viewer. Here, you can enable auto-tracking and select the pan parameters you want to track. Move the tracker to the object on screen and start the tracker. You'll get fast, intuitive results without the need to spend hours manually creating pan automation to match picture. Here, you can see the finished pan automation curve in the timeline. Or, open the pan window and use the new 3D perspective options to visualize the auto-panning movement in relation to the listener. You can also do manual pan tracking directly in the Fairlight Viewer. When it comes to immersive audio, version 19 offers improvements in MPEG-H and Dolby Atmos workflows, along with full support for recording, mixing, and delivering ambisonic spatial audio. Ambisonics is a full-sphere immersive surround audio format that can accurately represent the entire sound field around the listener. To begin, in Preferences, navigate to Video and Audio I.O. to Immersive Audio, and enable Ambisonics. Now, you'll have access to the full Ambisonics toolset so you can create Ambisonic tracks and buses up to fifth order. Use binaural monitoring to experience immersive sound while working with headphones, or choose a monitoring format that matches your delivery requirements and speaker configuration. The Fairlight Ambisonics panner displays 2D or 3D spherical panning within the sound field and can be used to position mono or stereo tracks within the field. Metering options include a single composite bar graph in the mixer and timeline and energy sonar or power displays. Use the space view scope to monitor high order ambisonic sources as they relate to other sounds and the room. Or enable 360 degree viewer mapping in the Fairlight viewer for dynamic graphical metering of either intensity or a sonar style view. There's even support for third-party ambisonic head tracking and plugins. The Fairlight Channel EQ has been updated with real-time analyzer and selectable slope for high-pass and low-pass filters. Right here. They're called friends. And sidechain control is now available for capable Fairlight effects and AU and VST plugins. We hope you enjoy exploring these and many more of the new features in DaVinci Resolve 19. Thank you for watching. Okay, so you can see there's a lot of new exciting features there and some really nice AI stuff too. You know, we use AI for so many things, so it's pretty cool. So now I want to talk about some of the new broadcast features. Um, as I mentioned before, DaVinci is mostly about high-end film and television production, but for years we've been trying to get broadcasters access to digital film quality, and it's been progressing really well. You know, broadcasters have adopted tools such as color correction of fusion effects and Fairlight Audio, um, so I think it's really exciting. But at IBC, we created a bit of a problem we created the new Blackmagic camera app, and it, look, it's really amazing. Vamos a de lo, it lets you shoot de with an broadcast. iPhone, it creates camera, proxy files, and then syncs live to Black, the Blackmagic app. Cloud website. So any DaVinci Resolve system that connects to that project will see the immediate arrive in real time. So it's pretty cool. And we also added that software to the uh, Ursa uh, Broadcast G2. So when you're shooting, uh, the media files just sync to DaVinci Resolve right into the bin, and that's globally. So it's pretty cool. Um, in fact, the cameras can literally log into the project and the shots arrive automatically. So it's great, but we caused the problem. Um, 
because now what we need to do is we need to get those shots to air in seconds. Yeah, we don't have a lot of time. Um, if the shots are coming in real time, then we don't want to wait. So this is the sort of problem we created. We have to now think about the post-production size side because we want to get those shots on air now. So we need faster editing. And that's what the cut page in DaVinci was for. It's basically for news cutting. Um, but there is a couple of other things we, that have happened over the last few years. Uh, we had to slow down the work on the cut page more than I would have liked um, for the last couple of years because there's been some big changes with computers. Apple released their own custom CPUs and these have been called the M1, M2 and M3 processors. Now what's unique about these CPUs is their massive speed. But what's really important for us is they've got built-in hardware codecs. They have ProRes in hardware. So it's like having a whole rack of ProRes encoders inside the CPU. Even the laptops are fast. It's really actually not like nothing we've ever seen. But it did mean that we had to rewrite all the processing in DaVinci Resolve. Um, these CPU, uh, CPUs process images in di a different way. And there were some new developer frameworks we had to adopt. Uh, so we realized if we rewrite all the code, it would give us a huge speed boost. And now DaVinci Resolve is the fastest app for image processing. Uh, but it also means we had to, you know, we, we got tied up a bit over the last couple of years. And now we've only just got back to working on the cut page. Um, so this year, we've got a bunch of new features in the cut page to show because we've been able to get back to it. Now, one of these uh, major features is faster shot selection. Now, if the shots are coming in in real time through Blackmagic Cloud, we want to be able to select them and edit really fast. Uh, but we noticed something else. Um, uh, broadcasters don't often have a lot of time to render to a server. They've got to get the story on air now, uh, which means the editor actually has to play to air. So this means we've added some, a bunch of playout features and it's kind of a replay system. So what we did is we actually designed a replay system and put it into DaVinci Resolve. It's built into DaVinci Resolve, which means the replay has the pa full power of DaVinci Resolve included, which means it integrates into a whole post-production workflow team. Um, so it's kind of an exciting combination. Um, you, know, you can essentially imagine each replay being converted into a social media post because the replay system is a great place for this because it's got access to all the cameras. So you get the best camera angles. It's, it's kind of like video tweets. Um, you could see, even sell advertising in the replays. I mean, who knows what's possible? It's very exciting. Um, you do get a replay system that's also very affordable. Um, but also, you also from designing a replay system, we get a lot of new editing features. So it was kind of an interesting way of thinking about how to improve the editing by doing replay, because replay kind of goes beyond editing. It's not editing, but it goes beyond it. So before I show you these new features, I wanted to show you an editor panel we've got. I don't really have time to show you a lot of the features it has, but um, I want to some, show you some of the new cut page features with it. Now, it's designed to be both a multicam editing panel and a replay panel. It's kind of a combination panel. So it supports Bluetooth and it has a really large internal battery. It's more like an advanced version of the uh, DaVinci Resolve Speed Editor, but it's got some big improvements. It's faster to use. Um, now, it's called the DaVinci Resolve Replay Editor. And let me show you, I'll bring it out. So here it is here. There it is. Um, now you can see what's, it's quite different to the speed editor, but it does have some, some similarities. We've spaced out the editor. keys further to help you use it faster. Now I don't have a lot of time in this video to explain everything. I think you guys can get that, get that there. Um, and I've got some slides I can show. But it has a lot of the great features from the speed editor. So you can see it's got the um, trim controls here. They've moved down to there. I've got the search tile over here. So it's beautiful. And we've also moved the undo away up to a key by itself where it's really easy to find. Um, we've also moved the camera buttons along the bottom there in a single line, so they're much easier to use. Um, they're just easy to locate by feel. That was one of the biggest problems with the speed editor. And it really helps speed up multicam editing. Now we've also got a couple of new, uh, we've got a trim all button over here. Um, now what this will do is it'll trim a proportional amount of every timeline clip. So all the clips get trimmed by a proportional amount. So it's really fast, they'll to sort of basically, you push that down and adjust the speed, uh, the, the search dial. And it's a really fast way of uh, trimming the entire um, timeline to a specific time. Uh, now it won't trim the audio track, which means you can actually trim the, all the video clips to an audio track. So it's really nice. You just press and hold that button, like the other trim controls here, and you use the search dial. Now we've also got a ripple delete. It's got a dedicated key now, because um, before it was a double press, um, which is over here. And um, we can also Tenemos change the speed of clips now, uh, which is another thing people want from the, uh, for the, from the speed editor. Muchos ya usábamos el Speed Editor para hacer esto, pero ahora sí ya tenemos un teclado para replay con multicámara y obviamente con mucho más shortcuts, botones ya prediseñados para ciertas actividades de replay. So this keyboard has so many features. I don't really have time, unfortunately, to go through them all. However, I can use the keyboard for an edit, and I can show you how it works by actually doing some editing with it. So let me show you some of the new edit, some of the new features on the cut page. So we'll, we'll head across. So let's um, go over here. 
move the keyboard out of the way. Ahora vamos a ir al software para verlo. All right, so I've got an overhead camera, so you might be able to look down and see some of the things I'm doing. So you might be, actually, I better bring DaVinci up. There it is. Um, so you might be familiar with the source tape. It flattens out all the media and lets you basically visually scroll across all your media. It's really great when using an edit keyboard. Um, it's like something we have on the DaVinci Resolve Speed Editor. So let me show you that. So if I click Source, there you see there. Now it's lined up all these shots. Now I've got a couple of shots here that have come in. And um, in fact, I don't need the mouse, I can just scroll. See, there you go there. Now it lines up all the shots sequentially, even if the shots are recorded at the same time. So it's a little bit of a disadvantage. I mean, it's great to browse the media visually, um, but their shots have been lined up end to end. And you can see here, I've got two different shots lined up end to end. Um, but that can make it hard to find shots that have been recorded at the same time, such as shots recovering, you know, uh, covering an important event, which is what news people deal with all the time. So we've added two new features to fix this. Uh, the first is called multi-source. It's a setting you can turn on, and it changes how the source tape works. It basically checks the time code on all the media, then displays any shots that line up in time side by side in a multi-view. So you can scroll and see the shots that match, and it makes it really easy to find multiple angles of the same event. So let me show you how that works. Now first I can select the multi-source button. We have a button on the panel for that, but we've also got, this is the button here, we've also got a button in the user interface here. So I can click that. And now you can see what it's done is it's changed it. Um, now it's changed the viewer and it's aligned the two shots in time. And wherever there's a match, I get a multi-view. So you can see both angles. Then I can edit them into the timeline. So let me just, before I do the edit, let me just go back and show you at the start here. You can see I only had one camera at the start here. And then the second camera started recording and now it's turned it into a multi-view because they've lined up in time. So I can edit these. If I want to do an edit, I can select, say, camera one. And I'll need to put an in and out point, so I'll put an in point, put an out point, then I can pend it into the timeline. Then I can go along and click on, and we can add the second angle by clicking on camera two. And I can add an in point, an output, I pen that. So you can see how nice it is. Now I've got two shots from different cameras of the same event, uh, but it's dynamic. If a new shot arrives, it automatically updates and I can see it. So let's upload another shot. Uh, I've got the guys, we've actually recorded this with three cameras. Um, so if we can upload the ca uh, third camera file guys and we'll um, let it come in. So we shot this on three cameras, but we only uploaded the two. Um, but uh, we're now uploading the third camera. So it'll automatically appear in the sync bin and we'll automatically see it. Um, it'll appear in the multi-view and that shot should arrive any second. So, oh, there it goes. And so you see it's just appeared. So it's in the bin and it's now in the multi-view. So I can see I've got a third shot. So I can scroll it a bit. See, there it is. So it's cool. So using the milk. And uh, let's add that shot to our edit. So we'll select camera three. There it is. We'll put an, in, an out point and we'll pen that. So this all just happens in seconds. It's so cool. That shot came in from Blackmagic Cloud. And you can really see how fast you can edit and get shots on into an edit. It's so fast. You can actually see the, uh, the uh, camera original hasn't come in yet because I've got the purple bar along there. So it's pretty cool. Now, of course, I can do this all on the panel. Uh, in this case, I just hold down the camera numbers and I can use the search style to load in. So let me show you how that works. It's even cooler. So, and this is nice about having the buttons along here now. So I can just add some of camera one and some of camera two and some of camera three. And it's so cool, you know, it's great. Now these edits are all on a pen, but if you want to insert the shot, then you just go right on the edit point and it'll insert it um, uh, in, the, in the edit point there. Um, but if you press the insert key while you're in multi-source, then it'll actually shift the timeline CTI to the closest edit point right on it. And then when you use the live override, it'll put it in as an insert. Um, but only if you're in multi-source and all cams. Um, now, if you're on top of a clip, uh, then it'll be a place on top. So you can actually modify how those clips go into the timeline. Now, there's another new uh, cut page tool for fast editing as well, and it's called point of interest. Now the point of interest is not a marker, but we have improved markers in DaVinci Resolve 19. They're a lot better, and even they're better on the panel. But point of interest is different. It's not connected to a timeline or a clip in any way. It's just time-based. It's, it's basically a point in time. It's like a bookmark. So once you have a set of POI, DaVinci changes how it's edited. So let's set a POI and I can show you. So we'll scroll along here and I'll set a POI. Now I've got a POI key, but there's also one on the user interface here. So there's my POI. Now DaVinci knows the point you're interested in, they can do a lot of editing features with the POI. Now you can see I've only got one POI here because I've set multi-source and all those clips are lining up in time. But let's turn off multi-source so you can see the media sequentially again. 
So I'll turn it off there. And now you can see uh, that we have a POI on each clip because now they're sequential. And the timeline also has POIs. You can see along the timeline down here, you can see the point of interest on the clips there as well um, because they match the POI time. Now let's turn the multi-source back on. I'll do it on the panel. Um, um, so POI is a great way of seeing an important event. Um, you can even do things like, um, if I go to the timeline and scroll along and I slip the clip, you can see mm. how the POI, the clip's sliding within that area. So it's pretty cool. Um, so the POI is always a, a clip time. Um, there's also a POI palette in the, uh, in the uh, interface here. Um, and it lets you set a specific date and time for a POI. Now the point of interest doesn't need media. It can be any time or date. So if something happens, you can set the POI time, like say something in the future. So then when the clips arrive, you can see which ones match the POI because there's an indicator as well as in the, in, the, in the clips. So there are a lot of other really nice new features in the cut page, uh, but the most exciting is the replay features. They're really cool. Um, so let's check out replay now and we can see, um, see what we've done uh, to make replay work in DaVinci Resolve. Now it could have been a separate app. We could have just done a replay app. But I think adding it to DaVinci Resolve makes it much more powerful because you get replay combined with really powerful editing. And it's not just simple playlists, which is what uh, replay systems have. So let me really describe how this works. So basically, I've got a rack here with all this uh, stuff in it set up for replay. So it's basically storage centric. So what I'm doing is I'm recording to a Blackmagic Cloud Store. Now I've got eight Hyperdeck Studio recorders in here. And they've got some new software that we've got for the Hyperdecks to allow network recording. So they record all directly to this network storage. Now I've actually set up a, um, each Hyperdeck Studio record into the same folder on the Blackmagic Cloud Store here. Although each deck is actually recording into a separate ISO folder that I've got within that folder. And I've also set each Hyperdeck to have a separate unique camera ID. Uh, and then I've also got this DaVinci Resolve uh, system connected to the, in this computer, connected to the Cloud Store as well. Um, so this will be doing the playback, this DaVinci Resolve is basically managing the playback side, which is connected to the Cloud Store. So it's really that simple. Um, so let's do a replay. Um, now the new replay features are controlled by a new replay palette, which is up the top here. This is it here. So you can click that and there's my replay palette. So it's pretty simple. Now it allows uh, really fast shot selection and playback to air. You can also sequence multiple shots um, and then you can transfer those uh, replays to the timeline. So then other people can do post-production work. Um, now it's got <laughs> the replay controls, which is Q, uh, run and dump. Because um, playing to air is different. It changes the way the video hardware works. So playing to air is different than normal playback. Now I can show you what that means, but first let's, let's create a new project because we'll do all our replay into a new project. Oops, cancel, I'll do it from here. I want to do it local. Let's do that. Now, in the palette, there's an add uh, to timeline selection, which I'll add, I'll turn on. Um, so anything we do between the run and the dump will be added to the timeline. So I've turned that on um, so that we can see how that works once I've created a replay. Now, the palette also has an indicator for the playback speed up here and um, it's also the time remaining in the replay. Now, what we need to do is get the, um, to get the replay to work, I need to start recording on these hyperdecks here. So I'll come over across and start recording on the hyperdecks. So if you can just track over, um, it's pretty easy. There we go. So all the remote controls are daisy chain. So I only need to record on the first deck and then all the other decks will go into record. Now the cloud store monitoring will show the data being written if you can check that out. Um, now I've got all the decks to record in ProRes 422 and I'm recording HD at 1080p 50. Um, also the media I'm recording is a cooking show, which is just, a, I'm doing a simple demo here. No one would obviously use a cooking show for a replay and not unless someone got horribly burned, um, but it works for this demo so I can show you how it all works. Now I have DaVinci Resolve's video output connected to the ATEM switcher. It's an Ultra Studio 4K Mini that's been updated to support replay. Now the fill and key output is connected to the ATEM downstream keyer. So this helps with automation. So I should obviously turn this key on um, there and I'll go to a different input there and uh, that uh, should be good. So I'm on air with that uh, key on. Um, now the replays will use the downstream key, so it should be cool. So now we've started the recording, we need to load the media into the bin. Uh, so DaVinci uh, Resolve can actually read these files even while they've been written now. That's another update for DaVinci. So let's load the media into the bin. So I've got to go, there's my record media. So I'll load that. I'll change my project frame rate. There it all is. Um, now we can visually browse all our media. If 
by um, going through it all. And um, we can use the source button for that, which I'm doing there, which is pretty cool. Now you can see all the media sequentially um, like that, um, but uh, we don't really want to do that. Uh, so we're using the new multi-source feature because we want to see all the um, what the hyperdecks are recording. Um, and so we want to see it in a multi-view and all aligned in time. Um, so we've got that. Now you can see all your cameras at once. Uh, it's pretty cool. You can scroll the viewers. Actually, I'll enlarge the viewer a bit. Um, and I can even play the views. So there they are there. Uh, this is really cool because this is way more powerful than a traditional multi uh, replay system that can't do all that. Um, and I can also select different views so I can switch between cameras. So that's really cool. Um, but camera, uh, eight cameras is actually a lot for replay. Um, I'll go back to all cams. It's a bit hard to track. So most people um, only do about four cameras for replay. So let's change it to four, uh, four cameras. And that's really easy to do because you can customize it by using what's in the bin. Um, so what I'll do is I'll remove four of the cameras we don't want, even while they're still being recorded, because we just want to use the four. So let's um, go back to our bin here. Actually, no, I want to go under there. So all we have to do is really get rid of these folders. Okay. Now when I go back to the multi-source, I only see the uh, the four views. Um, so you have the four-way multi-view. Uh, so now I can scroll the cameras, go down the back a bit, um, and I can switch between the specific cameras, of course, um, and go back. Um, and I use the keyboard number keys for that. Uh, so you can really see how nice it is to navigate. Um, it's really easy to see the cameras. Um, now the current multi-view is uh, also this this view and multi-view is also on the video output, so the director can see what you're doing. Um, so you can you know, navigate in the cameras and show people things. Um, so it's quite cool. And you can also see over on the bin over here, I've got the icons on the files to show that they're actually currently being recorded into, which is really cool. So let's just see which clips are the live recordings. Um, also the media in the uh, viewer here is, is growing. It's, you can see it actually bumping along as the recordings are getting longer because DaVinci is actively watching the files grow because this media in here is increasing in length. It's pretty cool. Um, so it's kind of weird to see it doing that. So now let's do a replay. Um, so the first thing I want to do is switch the video input. So I can do there. Now what I'm doing is I'm watching a live uh, multi-view from the ATEM switcher because there's no latency and I get a live view of the action so I can wait for an event to happen. Um, so when something happens, I'll use the POI for that. Um, so what I'll do is I'll grab a POI. Uh, so when I do the POI on the video input, it'll actually grab the um, POI from the time code source on the video input. Because um, I want to mark something that's happening now. So the time code input is actually the most accurate POI time. Uh, so when I set the POI, a whole bunch of stuff will then happen. Now what'll happen is it'll grab the POI from the time code on the input, then it'll switch back to the viewer and it'll go to that POI. And the media will have just come in at that Estamos point because obviously the es el... viewer side has still uh, got the media appearing. Um, no, I went to input view on this con uh, integración keyboard here, but there's actually a button for input view. Al teclado. Pod, which I can't see because I'm on the input view. Yeah. De, um, de replay. So what will happen is the viewer will be confused. Interesante de esto es que explicaba en un principio es que todo esto lo han podido lograr gracias a la evolución de los mismos procesadores de las computadoras nuevas. Él hablaba del M1, M2, M3 de Apple y todo esto se puede hacer gracias a eso, o sea, los multiview, lo que es el timecode, lo que es integrar esto ha sido un trabajo tanto de software, hardware, y obviamente se nota que Da Vinci tiene mucha, mucha importancia en Blackmagic. Sí, just there. So you can see, and of course that's moving to the left because there's media growing on the right hand side there. So it's pretty cool. Now there's also an indicator to show me how far away from the PO I am, which is really kind of important. Me han consultado cuándo van a estar disponibles. Bueno, Da Vinci, el beta ya está listo. You can see I'm four, five, six seconds away from the PO I time. Pero Which lo que cool. es el, el teclado, que está muy bueno, el micro panel, va a estar disponible en Estados Unidos en mayo. Y nosotros esperamos tenerlo en, tanto en Caracas como Santiago de Chile para la primera semana o segunda semana de junio. Pero el lunes vamos a tener más, más información directo del stand o el booth de Blackmagic. 
and that's all I need to do. So basically now I'm ready to play this uh, shot to air. Um, however, one of the problems is you often you don't want to do the replay immediately. The game could still be playing. The director wanted to have that ready as a replay, but not actually do that replay. Something else might uh, happen. So I can switch back to the input view anytime I want. I know I've got that replay ready to go. So I can switch back to the, my um, input, the replay is ready. If nothing really interesting happens, then I go back to the source by pushing source again, and I'm back here ready to go. So if they say they want to run the replay, I can just go back and play that air, uh, to air by pushing the run button. Now there's a run button here, so I can push that. And now what's happened is something really interesting has happened. So you can see that the viewer has changed to a multi-view while I'm doing that, but the video output is at playing camera two. Um, so you can see that happening there. That's a very important feature, because what it allows us to do is shot sequencing. So I can review the next shot, which I can see now. I've got camera one is playing to air, but I might decide that I want to do camera four. Um, so what it lets me do is I can get really fast, I can get the first shot to air, and once that's playing, I can see the multi-view and see if I've got a different shot that I want to sequence to, because I'm watching a multi-view on the viewer here. Um, and I can see how, you know, camera four looks good. So what I want to do is I want to decide I want to run that camera four next as my second shot. Um, I don't need a second replay channel to do this, I can just do it from here. So while the first shot's playing, um, when I play to where with the run, the viewer is always a multi-view, uh, and the output video output is the full frame camera. Now the reason this works is because of the POI. Uh, DaVinci knows what I'm interested in, it knows where the POI is. I've played a fair way past it at this point. Um, so while I'm playing, so I can scroll back to before the POI, and while I'm playing the first camera, which is what it's doing now, um, I'm going to switch back to camera four. So let's do that. So to do that, what I'll do is I'll select three seconds. So I'll basically press and hold a time key, which will be three seconds, and then I'll press camera four. And what it'll do is it'll jump back uh, three seconds before the POI and change to camera four on the program video app while that happens. So let's do that. So there's three seconds there. and I'll push camera four. And now what it's done is it's jumped back, and you see she's put the plate down, and um, I can basically uh, jump back and forth between the two cameras so you can see it, which I can do, and that'll repeat what I'm doing, so you can kind of see how this works, because you've got to do it a few times and you'll start to see what I'm doing. So what I'll do is I'll push um, three seconds, and I'll jump back and forward, see where she puts the plate down, that's camera one, and that's camera two while she's moving out of the shot there. Um, but you can see, all I have to do is push the camera button, and it'll go back three seconds before the POI. And the same thing, because I'm doing the same amount of time and we're just switching between these two cameras, makes it a bit easy to see what's happening. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Of course, I can do the same thing with other cameras. So that's basically doing an auto uh, shot sequencing. So it's pretty cool. Um, it makes it really easy to do a multi-shot replay. The switch operator is not even distracted by any of the replays. The replay operator can do the whole replay. They can manage the whole thing. Plus we can add transitions. So I was using cuts here, so let's use dissolves. Um, so normally uh, these keys, the dissolve keys down here, do they add a transition. But when you're playing to air, they change, they become a, a transition enable. Um, so what we can do, it's, it's really nice to see. Um, so I can turn on dissolve and I can do some, some of these. Now it'll do a dissolve between the cameras. It's pretty cool. And then I can, this is so like nice to use. And of course I can stop the replay at any time. And uh, now we do that by pressing the dump button. So let's do that. There it is, now it's finished. Um, so it's gone back to the, uh, the switcher source that was, because it's turned off the key up. So you might've noticed that the clips in the timeline have appeared. Um, so I can switch to the timeline now and scroll along. And I was talking a fair bit at the front there. Uh, sorry, go there. So I can go down here. So you can see I was doing a bunch of shots between the replays. And then I was talking a bit more. And then down here, I was doing the transitions. Podemos crear patrones so de edición cool. que se repiten um, una so y otra vez en una multicámara. So y lo repite y lo vuelve a hacer sin tener que hacerlo a todo nuestro when not this, obviously, Nuestra but escena grabada, um, pregrabada. You might want to add some graphics to the front and maybe change the aspect ratio. Ayuda en tiempo de edición you know, like enormemente. Y le puedes decir en qué estás interesado. What's important to sort of hacer. understand about the dump feature is kind of how the button works. It doesn't just stop playback there like I just did there. It actually does more than that. It's intelligent. 
So it does define the end of a replay, but it won't just stop the replay instantly. What it'll do is if, you know, if you're doing a transition, for example, like you were doing one of those dissolves here, um, you don't really want it to happen immediately. So what it'll do, it'll wait a few seconds because you don't want a bad edit, um, and then it'll finish the replay. Now you can still crash out if you hit uh, dump multiple times, um, just double press dump and it'll finish the replay. So you can crash out, but it's gonna be a bit more elegant. It's elegant, it's a bit more intelligent than just, just immediately finishing. Okay, now let's check out auto stingers. Um, so what I'll do is um, I'll turn off the add to timeline so we don't keep adding to the timeline. Um, now let's, what we know is we'll load a stinger because we have a feature called auto stingers. So let me show you how that works. There's my stinger, there it is. So now the next step is to uh, turn on the auto stinger. There it is there. Um, now the auto stinger's on, uh, the stinger power will appear and you can load multiple stingers in here and you can switch between them on the panel or on the front here. Um, also the timeline changes to show that the auto stinger's turned on. So you'll see some indications there. Um, so let's load stinger one. So we'll go into our stinger, load it in. There it is. Now when I do a replay, it'll add a stinger. Um, now if there's an alpha channel in the stinger, it'll output that before the timeline starts to play. That's because the stinger starts to play before the timeline media. Um, we'll go to our POI. Come on. There we are. Um, and I'll uh, select camera one. So uh, the switcher basically is gonna do the overlay in the downstream keyer. So once the, switch, uh, switch, once the stinger gets to the midpoint, it'll overlay the second half of the stinger over the timeline clip. And it does that also at the end of the replay, but in reverse. So you actually get the alpha channel and the stinger coming through. So let's press run and we'll see how that goes and you'll see the stinger, if I cut to the video out, you'll see the stinger run. There it goes. It's covered over the live switcher output and there's my replay. Now I can switch to camera four again. So when I press dump, it then ran the stinger again. So let's do it again, it's quite cool. There it goes, there's my stinger. Sí, efectivamente es mucho más then I'll press dump. avanzado en la creación de macros como vimos ahí pudo ingestar una escena y programarla um, para so varios lugares de la, de la edición and the switcher operator doesn't need to do anything. The replay yeah, I mean, does everything. Stingers. The shot sequencing and the stingers. Mm -hmm. And you notice that it changes the downstream key because when I run to air, the alpha channel does uh, goes white and enables the replay. And also, Ultra Studio 4K Mini sets the main SDI fill and, um, key outputs to black, and it also mutes the audio. Um, also, the auto stinger doesn't get added to the timeline when you uh, select add to timeline because the timeline will become an edit. So you just want the clips. You don't want all the stingers and things in there. Uh, now I can also play out a timeline with Auto Stinger as well. Um, because it's a timeline, you can use the cue. So we'll go back to the start. And then when I press run, it'll add a stinger. And now it's using the timeline as a, a replay. Um, and it'll automatically run the stinger at the end of the replay, which is a fair length, uh, length, so I won't wait until the end. Now that could be like a breaking news story, which we just got a breaking news story over a cooking show. Um, so you can see how you could use that for like replaying breaking news or something like that. Um, so it's pretty cool. Now we also have speed changes in the panel. Uh, we use the fader for that. So you can uh, change the playback speed. So if we play, um, there's also an enable button because you don't want to accidentally turn on the uh, speed change by accident. Um, so we play the timeline and I can turn on speed change and start to slow it down. So you see it's cool. It's a lot of fun to use. So it's pretty cool. I'll turn that back off. Um, now we're using eight HyperDeck Studios in a Blackmagic Cloud Store here, and that's a very high-end solution. But what about lower, uh, lower cost option? And we've been working on that. What we wanna do is we wanna make the uh, ATEM Mini Extreme ISO switches uh, work. Uh, but it's a bit different though. They're obviously a little bit different. Uh, the trick is to use the ISO record files, but those files are H64, so they're a little bit slower because they're a little bit more latency, but it still works. So we've been doing working on a software update that adds network storage support into the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO. And that would let the DaVinci access the USB record disk via the Ethernet connection on the back of the A10 Mini Extreme ISO. Um, now to get a live video input like we're doing here, we'd use the USB webcam and we have a software update to allow the multi-view to come through. And that lets us um, get the multi-view into DaVinci Resolve for the live input. And that input also, the USB input also provides time code for the POI. Um, so you can play back uh, into the A10 Mini Extreme using maybe an Ultra Studio Mini monitor. Now it doesn't do the alpha channel blending thing, um, not unless you have a lot more powerful hardware. Uh, so you just cut to the playback, so it's pretty nice. But you would get a replay for no cost. Um, 
Now the work, um, it works on an ATEM Mini Extreme ISO you already have, and I think it'll be really exciting to see how people use it. So keep an eye out for an update for the ATEM switches, because we hope that they have that software update out pretty soon. Um, we also hope to have that showing uh, on the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO doing replay at our NAB booth. So if you're coming to the show, come by and check that out, because I'm pretty sure we're gonna get that to work. Also, the ATEM Television Studio um, HD ISO does ISO recording, but already has network storage access, and the recordings are also H64 files. Now, they weren't designed for replay, so we're also working for a software update for that switcher as well to reduce latency, and that should make large. So we're gonna post a public beta of DaVinci Resolve, and that should be released in the next few days. Now, the new DaVinci Resolve replay editor will be uh, 495, and that should be available in May. There'll also be an update for Ultra Studio 4K Mini available from today. Uh, it'll add the mute feature for the fill and key outputs, um, which helps uh, replay when using uh, the keyer and the switcher. Um, there's also an update for all newer HyperDeck Studio models that adds the network recording, um, and that'll be HyperDeck 9.4. Now, all these updates are free of charge, and so you can just go and download these updates and get the new features, so keep an eye out for them. Um, there's also another interesting HyperDeck feature that I haven't talked about yet, and we haven't had time really to demo it because I thought that was probably long enough. Um, now, we've been working on the HyperDeck uh, Extreme 8K to add four channels of recording into it. So it means you can record four channels of Ultra HD on a single deck, and if you put two of them in a rack side by side, that's eight channels in only three rack units in size. So I think that'll be a really nice update. Um, so it'll be worth keeping an eye on it. Now, when it comes to the playback of the video here that we were doing, Ultra Studio 4K Mini is not really designed for the job. It's basically a general capture and playback solution. So it has lots of video ins and outputs, but it's not really designed for the replay. It doesn't support fill and key in 10 bit at the highest Ultra HD 60 frames a second. So what we've done is we've decided to design a product dedicated for replay. Um, and the, re the reason is the way kind of broadcasters work. You know, if you look at a, a broadcast van or a studio, the, the equipment's all built in, the monitors are, uh, are installed in a control room. So you don't really want monitors on desks, especially in broadcast trucks, they'll just fall over. Um, so what we really needed to do was design something that allows a, a better and capture playback product but designed for broadcast use, and we've done that. It's called Blackmagic Media Player 10G. It's a Thunderbolt capture and playback solution, but it's designed for broadcast uh, playback. Now, it has a lot of features, and we'll check it out. I've got some slides. Now, on the front panel, we've got the LCD for status, and there's a headphone socket and a speaker and an enable button, but there's also Thunderbolt on the front, so you can actually uh, install this into a control room desk and walk right up and plug into that socket on the front. Now, that's great if you're using a laptop. Now, it'll also power the laptop. Um, so this is really cool because you can set up the laptop any way you want. You just walk up and plug in with a single cable. So it's really cool. Now the rear connections I've got a slide for um, shows you what you get. Now the first is a, the power connection. That's AC power. Now next to that's a Thunderbolt connection on the back as well. So you can use the front or the back depending on how you're installing the computer or if you're using a laptop. Um, so obviously the one on the back is used when the equipment, like maybe the computer's in a rack. Um, there's also 10G Ethernet. So what this means is your computer gets an Ethernet connection when you plug the Thunderbolt in, so you can access the network storage like we were doing here. Um, now at the top, there's a 12G SDI fill and key output. Now these are the main 10-bit program outs. They go up to 2160p60 with fill and key in 10-bit. They're enabled when you're playing back to air and they're muted when they're off air. Um, both the audio and the video is muted. Um, so that means you can use a downstream keyer and then playback the alpha channel uh, will automatically enable the playout when you uh, run a playout using the run button. Now we've also added um, a 12G SDI input. Now this is obviously where you connect the multi-view from the switcher for replay, so you need that input. Um, and Blackmagic desktop video products are bi-directional, which is the driver that works for this. So you can input video, you could process, uh, process it and output at the same time. So you can use this for like various kinds of computer-based processing engines. So if you wanted to use some AI code or something for broadcast, you could do that. So it's not just obviously for DaVinci, but it's for all kinds of broadcast use. Now next to that, if you look at the back panel, you'll see we've got a 12G SDI output and HDMI outputs, and that's for an extended desktop. Um, so this makes the computer think that it's got an extended desktop, which means that the UI monitor can also be built into the control room desk. Um, so this is like for the DaVinci Resolve user interface. Um, and there's also a USB there, which is also a USB port added to the computer, so you can have a local mouse and keyboard. Um, so it's pretty cool. Uh, you basically get everything for the extended desktop and everything in the one, but we also have an additional monitor output, and that's 12G SDI and HDMI. Now that's the same video as the fill and key output, but it's never muted. And that's what you'd run into your edit monitor so you can keep editing. Um, so you always get video, you always get sound on that. And that's where you connect your video monitor first. So you can keep working while your uh, on-air output is muted, but this is your live output that's always there. Now 12G SDI, that's great when you're connecting to routers and SDI monitors, but HDMI is great for a local computer monitor. It's great to have both options on both of those connectors. 
And we also have a balanced XLR audio monitoring outputs, which is great for like powered speakers. And lastly, there's a broadcast style RF switcher to remote input that uses standard deck control protocol. And that allows a remote control of the connected software. So this is where you could get, uh, you know, like automation systems controlling DaVinci and maybe playing their air directly. So that's something broadcasters need. So you get all these connections with a single Thunderbolt cable. Plus it keeps your computer charged. So it's really cool. Um, so, you know, Reflay and graphics operators can use their own computer. They can have all their own preferred settings and titles and stingers and they just roll up on a job and plug in. So they can set up offline. They can, even at home, they walk up, they plug in and they, it connects and everything's ready to go. Uh, the whole system is connected through that one Thunderbolt cable. So like all Blackmagic Deck, like an Ultra Studio products, there's um, an SDK, so developers can create their own custom solutions, and that's a free download. Now, I think this is a great new model. Uh, the, blank, the new Blackmagic Media Player will be priced at 995. We expect it to be available in July, which is a little later than the other products, but after doing some replay work, we actually had to make some design changes, so we kind of rearranged the back panel. So it's a much better product now. Um, and it's perfect for all kinds of media broadcast, uh, playback, it's really the ultimate broadcast breakout box for laptop and desktop computers. So it's pretty cool. So now I want to talk about storage. Um, so this replay solution is great, but it really depends on the storage. The storage has to be really fast, has to handle a lot of record channels all at the same time. Plus you need to connect DaVinci Resolve all at the same time. So what we've done is we have the Rackmount Cloud Store Mini, and that's a fantastic little network storage product. There's a newer 16 terabyte model we released a couple of weeks ago, which can be used for replay. Uh, and I've used a for Ultra HD, but it's only got a single 10G the net port. So you know, that 10G Ethernet port can get overloaded pretty quickly. So we wanted something with high performance, um, something with a lot more speed and storage capacity. And that's important when you're running Ultra HD. So we have a new model of Blackmagic Cloud Store. It's called Blackmagic Cloud Store Max, and it's even faster than the Cloud Store Mini. Let me show you, I'll bring it out. Um, so you can see, the problem of cloud here. storage. Let's put it on the desk. The Blackmagic has um, pressure, so you no? see it's a, a, got an LCD on the front there. So you can get a shot of that with the camera. So. The Cloud Store Max comes in two capacities. There's a 24 terabyte model and a larger 48 terabyte model. Now internally, it's actually got 12 M.2 flash memory cards in a RAID 0 configuration. So it's extremely fast. All those cards work in parallel for incredible speed and very low latency. I mean, you can see the low latency we're doing, we're doing the replays there. Uh, so let's check out the back. And this is where it gets really interesting. So here you can see that we've got AC power connection and we've also got a broadcast DC backup power supply connection. We've got a QSF P socket, which allows 100 G Ethernet into this, so it's very fast. It's very quiet, it's got quiet fans. Um, so of course, see with that socket, you can use optical fiber or copper cables. It's also got the four 10G Ethernet, so you can plug in um, uh, recorders and, and workstations straight into the back if you want. Now it's got some interesting monitoring. The um, monitoring is now both SDI and HDMI. SDI is nice because you can plug the monitoring into a router and keep track of what the storage is doing. I find that really nice, like we were showing before, when you started recording, you could see the speed to get a feeling for how heavily loaded the storage is. Or you can use the HDMI for a TV or a computer monitor. I think it's nice having the monitoring output. Um, it's the same monitoring output the other cloud store models have. So it's got that storage map, the speed graphs, the number of active users and the storage status. Plus if it syncs to Blackmagic Cloud website, you can see the syncs in there. Um, so it's really nice. And um, it does the global media sync now with obviously Blackmagic Cloud. Um, so each DaVinci Resolve user doesn't need to use storage on their own computers. If you're doing post-production, they can just use this as a storage or like a work group storage centric thing. It understands the proxy, so it'll bring those down first. Um, so I think this model will be extremely useful. It, you know, it, it allows replay and high resolution frame rates, but it also it's a great, fantastic core of a whole post-production film production system as well. Now, the great thing about our cloud stores is we don't do any subscriptions to use them. There's no, it's private storage, so it's secure. It's a very simple utility to maintain it. You don't have to use a weird website, so you can get it off the internet. Um, and obviously the, the software that comes with it's a free utility for Mac and Windows. Um, so I think this is a really great new model. It's really nice. Um, now the new Blackmagic Cloud Store Max 24 terabyte will be priced at 6495. And we also have this larger capacity one, which is 48 terabyte. And that's called the Blackmagic Cloud Store Max 48 terabyte. And it'll be priced at 9995. So that'll be available in May. Uh, now we have some really big powerful updates for Blackmagic Cloud this year. This is for obviously large broadcasters, but also for high end post-production. We've been working really hard on these features. Now, one of the features is rental licenses, and this is for the full DaVinci Resolve Studio. Now, I'm not a big fan of paying for cloud licenses for creative software. You know, it locks up the archive of your work unless you keep paying, but large customers need it. You know, they can't purchase software because they can't manage the licenses. Plus, large companies have complex accounting departments. They don't want to buy licenses because they've got to manage them as assets. 
uh, they've got to manage where they are, um, dongles and, and license keys. So what they do is they need, and also they need to cost the license cost against the show or the film. Uh, so rental licenses are also faster to get up and running. With rental licenses, you can like spin up 100 new licenses in seconds, and then they can cost those licenses against the show. They can cancel the, the licenses when the show's finished, or they can add and remove uh, staff from, you know, as they like. So for large companies, rental licenses are actually quite simple. Now, the good thing about DaVinci Resolve is you can still buy it outright. Uh, so this means that the, um, the rental licenses really complement the paid licenses. You'll never have to worry about locking up your work. Um, if someone assigns you a license via Blackmagic Cloud, then you don't need to enter the license key. Um, you just enter your Blackmagic Cloud ID and the software will just work. So, and then, of course, if you don't have the license anymore, then you can just use the paid version. You know, it's up to you. So I think that's the most flexible way we can do it while also making large customers happy. Now, to sort of help manage a lot of this stuff, we also have another new feature called organizations. Now, this lets you set up an organization and add staff. Again, it's something large companies need. Um, inside the organization, you can also then create groups. So the organization is your company, and then the group can be like a specific TV show or film or newsroom. Now, this has some big advantages because you can now share a project or a presentation with a whole group. You can share a rental license with everybody in a group. Um, so everybody in a show would automatically get a DaVinci Resolve Studio license. Um, so organizations is, is much faster than adding all people one at a time because you can define these large groups of people and it's extremely powerful. And all the billing information in organizations is, is shown. So you can then get the costs for each group and you can assign that to a show. Um, but one of the other big reasons for the organizations feature in Blackmagic Cloud is the single sign-on. You know, these large companies have these IT departments that assign new staff and email address. And with organizations, you can now connect those systems to their single sign-in thing. So you can set up organizations manually just by going to the new Blackmagic Cloud organizations feature, but these large companies have these information systems where that information can come in from the IT system. So the organization and the groups would all be created automatically. And as they add new staff, they would come into the organizations automatically. And um, so it'd be really cool. Now, organizations will be available in Blackmagic in the Blackmagic Cloud website in the next day or so. And for the single sign-on, um, at the moment we're working with live customers directly with this. Now, we want to automate it in the future, but what we really want to do is make sure that we have compatibility with all these IT systems first. So any large customers that want to work with uh, their single sign-in, they just you know, contact one of our offices and we can get that to work. So that's really cool. Now, one of the other new features of Blackmagic Cloud is syncing to the Blackmagic Cloud stores, like this guy here. Um, customers are using these massive media files and Google and Dropbox, have, uh, Google Drive and Dropbox haven't been really been handling it very well. Um, so using Blackmagic Cloud to sync the files between the cloud stores is much better. You can sync the media global and there's, globally and there's no file size limitations. So it works much better. You know, it's our software running on both ends. We can make it really fine tune it. So to get this feature, look out for a new Blackmagic Cloud software update. It should be available in the next few days and that'll actually then enable our Blackmagic Cloud stores and all the cloud stores to sync to the, uh, the Blackmagic Cloud website. Okay, so now let's talk about cameras. Um, so when we originally developed our Ursa Mini Pro, we took some risks with that design. We wanted to be a high-end digital film camera, but we wanted to add a lot of controls and features. Um, we took a lot of ideas from broadcast cameras, funny enough, and we wanted it to be affordable. So we really wanted to use uh, broadcast connections. Um, and that was kind of a great idea until we launched that 12K sensor. And that was an extremely high-end uh, feature film sensor and the high-end film industry loved the sensor but the camera body now became the limit. Uh, it didn't really have the correct film industry connections. It makes it really hard to add accessories used for film shoots. So we wanted to fix that. But also we kind of thought a bit more deeply about it. We sort of started to think about what a new digital film camera might be. What if money was no object? What happens if, uh, you know, in our past cameras, we've always worried about affordability. What if we didn't care about cost? What could we actually build? So the good thing is we had a lot of really good ideas. We had some really good project goals if money was no object. And, we wanted to build our dream sensor. high-end digital film camera. Yeah, we wanted to have everything we could have ever wanted. We wanted no limits on features. And, no de la nueva cámara, ahora. and we also wanted to design a whole new generation of image sensor. Y and we wanted that camera integrated in the whole post-production process. Sensor, plus the whole post-production workflows with Blackmagic Nuevo Cloud. Diseño, we've done all that. The camera's called Blackmagic Ursa Cine. Um, so first, actually, though, I want to check, uh, show you the new 12K sensors. Sensor full frame. And this is our second generation of... Uh, Blackmagic Design designed 12K sensor. Um, let me make some space here. Well, wow. <clears throat> give ourselves a bit of space to move. So you can see here it is here. 16. So 
Están hablando de 16 de rango dinámico. No se tenía hasta ahora ese, ese sensor 12K totalmente nuevo, full frame. That's the new sensor there. Now the sensor is natively 3 by 2 open gate. It supports a lot of different uh, ratios and formats from spherical and anamorphic lenses. It's got a massive 16 stops of dynamic range. That's the most of any Blackmagic camera by far. It's got larger photo sites than this sensor for better light kill acting ability. And it's also got the symmetrical RGBW um, sensor design, so we can do in sensor scaling. Now the dimensions of this sensor are 35.64 millimeters by 23.32 millimeters, and the resolution is 12,288 uh, pixels by 8,040 pixels. Um, but we've also worked a fair bit on the color science on this new generation sensor, and we've actually added the DaVinci Resolve color science into the image sensor itself which is really quite unique and quite revolutionary. You know, so the sensor pixel pitch and the color filter ray is much denser and different to simple Bayer sensors. So the images are spectacular. Uh, it's kind of like a new type of film stock. You know, you get much better color reproduction. <laughs> Plus there's clear pixels in the color array, so you get better uh, boost in sensitivity. And the higher resolution allows really smooth images with better handling of fine detail. So the images are just really high quality without sí, being overly sharp like and harsh. Uh, Plus, you know, that excessive resolution gives you full RGB color at the delivery resolution, which is really nice. Um, I'll put them back there. Uh, I kind of always feel weird touching sensors. It just feels wrong. Now the color filter is also symmetrical. So like I was saying before, you can do in sensor scaling without harsh aliasing. So now let's check out the camera. Um, so I'll bring the camera out. Here it is here. So you can see it's a whole new design. Um, now the lens mount, if you can get a shot of the front there, the lens mount uh, includes the shims now for fast changeover when you're rigging the camera. And there's also both PL and EF locking lens mounts included with the camera. Um, the camera has an optical low pass filter installed and it's been designed for the 12K sensor. Plus it has built in ND filters with two viewfinder stop increments and they're electronic controls. Um, Sí, sí, pero, pero la forma de, de, de sostener el viewfinder era, el anterior era, ahora con rods, mucho más. Ahora el viewfinder conecta con USB-C, y eso es una muy buena idea, porque USB-C tiene dos power y muy rápido de data, así que es un simple, fin cable, y tiene el USB locking screw, así que el cable no va a salir. Now on the front, we've got all film connections. So I think if I can show you that there, you can see that shot there. It's got a seven pin Lemo, uh, external connector. It's a serial connection with 24 volt uh, power and start and stop information. Um, and that's for the uh, camera control for focus motors. Mm -hmm. And it's also got a three pin Fisher RS connector with 24 volt uh, power output. And that connector also has a pin to trigger the recording start and stop as well. So that's great for hand grips. Sí, and there's two base, base plates to choose from and they work with all the standard dovetail um, plates. There's a 90, the 90 mil base plates included with the camera that also does 15 mil, uh, but we have a dedicated 15 mil plate as well. Uh, plus we've designed a whole bunch of accessories uh, designed for the camera. This includes the viewfinder, the top handle, rail, shoulder mount, battery plate handles, everything. And the accessories have all been designed in the same style as the camera. Um, so let me show you the, uh, the side here. So the buttons are all back now. M2. They don't make a sound when they're pressed, they're quiet. Uh, now the external uh, monitor here is now a color LCD and there's a five inch LCD that fully roll, uh, rotates and folds back into the camera. So let me show you that. So you can see the, the screen there, it rotates and it also folds back into the camera like that. So you see, it's really cool. Um, now there's a high speed memory module inside. Uh, you can see the memory module here. It's got basically cloud storage built in. You can remove it there. There it is there. Now this module's eight terabytes inside and there's 16 lanes of PCI Express going to this module. So it's extremely fast. And what it does, it eliminates all the problems with media cards. Um, so let's check out the rest of the camera. I'll put this back in. Um, now there's a rear mount. Let's go around to the rear side here. So you can see that there. Uh, there's a rear mounted USB-C for recording to external discs. Let me get a shot of that, is that okay? Now we've got two 12G SDI video outputs and they work in Ultra HD, so it means you can have two different monitors on set with different overlays on each monitor. Plus there's also a BNC timecode reference and sync input, so it's really great for syncing cameras on set. Um, we've also got uh, high-speed 10G Ethernet and it gives you really fast access to the internal storage. 
So you basically, it's it's like a cloud store access. So what that means is you can plug a DaVinci Resolve system into the camera and, and color grade on set from the media inside the camera. It's awesome. Uh, but it syncs extremely fast to Blackmagic Cloud because obviously it's 10G Ethernet. Now the power input supports both 12 and 24 volt operation and it supports multiple battery plates uh, from different battery systems. Uh, so let's have a look across the top of the camera if we can get a shot there. Um, so we've got these dual antennas. It's got extremely high speed Wi-Fi built into it. So it lets you upload media from the cameras in real time without being tethered. Plus it actually has built in SRT live streaming. So what you can do is you can live stream the clients off site and they can watch you shoot. When again, it's our dream camera. Um, so let's check out the other side. Um, actually, I should turn it on. I haven't turned it no. on. Let's turn it on. Here's the power switch here. So um, the power's on very quickly because it runs Blackmagic OS. Um, so what we can do is, um, I'll fold the screen in here. So we have this assist station on this side of the camera. Now we had this on the original Ursa camera. It was really popular. So it's very nice to have it back. Now it has a sun shield here, so I can open up the sun shield. Um, so it has that there. Plus you can remove it. It's fine keeping it there. Um, now we've got quite a lot of new features on this screen. It includes the standard heads up display plus menus. I can show you the menus. There it is there. Um, so we also have a focus page. Está bueno, no? You can see it there. Está bueno so let's the focus pull and see the, the lens um, and set markers so we can add focal. some markers. There. It's a bit hard to use from the other side. And so as we change the focus, you can use them to set focus points. Um, there's also space on this screen to add a bunch of new um, things. Um, we're gonna work with film crews and, and some of the more high-end customers over the next few months to add a few more features into this assist screen. We think we can go a lot more further with it. Um, but again, because it's used by high-end film crews, we wanna make sure we work with people to finish those screens. But I think we've got a lot of flexibility on that side to add all kinds of interesting features. Now across the top of the camera here, we have two more USB ports and um, you can see them there. And what that it does, it allows us to add like USB expansion for like third party accessories. And so there's a lot of expansion on the camera. Now let's talk about some of the camera specifications because that tells you what basically you can do. Now, as I mentioned, it had extremely fast processing. The media module su uh, supports four M.2 cards and each M.2 card in the module has four lanes of PCI Express. Uh, to it, which means that the, with the four cards, you get 16 lanes of PCI Express in total, which means it handles massive resolutions and frame rates. Then with the 10G Ethernet, you can access the module basically as like a DIT card built into the camera. As for resolutions and frame rates, at 12K open gate at three by two, uh, recording at 12K uh, by 8K, it's up to 80 frames a second. At 12K 70 by nine, which is 12K by 6K, it can record up to 100 frames a second. Then at 12K 2.4 by one widescreen, which is 12K by 5K, it can record up to 120 frames a second. Then at 8K open gate, three by two, it can record up to 144 frames a second. At 8K 17 by nine, it can record up to 180 frames a second. At 8K 2.4 by one widescreen, it can record up to 224 frames a second. And it can also do 9K three by two and six uh, by five formats for like Super 35 four perf. So it gives you a lot of compatibility with a lot of spherical and anamorphic 35, Super 35 uh, lenses, sorry. It can also handle like 9K, 70x9 and 60x9 formats, which are similar to Super 35 3 perf. Um, it can also do uh, 9K 2.4 by one, which is similar to Super uh, 35 2 perf. Uh, so the large sensor can be scaled and cropped in a lot of different ways, so it's very flexible. Uh, now for the post-production uh, side of it, it was one of the really important features of this camera. So we have the fast media module, um, we also have the fast 10G Ethernet on the back for uh, upload of media from post-production. But the camera will also record high resolution, uh, sorry, HD resolution H64 proxies at the same time it records 12K Blackmagic RAW. So it'll sync um, to Blackmagic Cloud using fast Wi-Fi 10G Ethernet and those proxies will go up really quickly. Um, now the Blackmagic Cloud website will then distribute those files to everybody else um, in the post-production teams. Um, now we have a three bay uh, rack mountable uh, Blackmagic Cloud uh, three media dock coming up. I'm going to get that one next. No, a color correcting from those modules. Um, so it means you can offload uh, the, the media card offload times reduced because you can basically move the modules out of the camera and place the modules in the camera. So I think it'd be pretty cool. 
So it really is an amazing camera. Um, I'd love to show you a quick video that we shot with it and it can it sort of shows you the results you can get. Plus it shows you some of the behind the scenes action, how we had two Ursus Cine 12K cameras on this shoot. So let's play the video. Estamos hablando de una cámara totalmente nueva. Nuevo sensor full frame 12K. Hablaban de 16 stop de rango dinámico y lo interesante es que han logrado esto eh, cambiando lo que es el, el sistema de almacenamiento con tarjetas M2 que son muy muy rápidos. Pero también la cámara podría grabar externamente a discos por USB-C. Okay. Eh, la cámara a la vez tiene antenas en el diseño, tiene antenas de, de transmisión para el cloud de Blackmagic, o sea que podríamos estar grabando y a la vez subiendo el material al cloud de Blackmagic. Y las tomas que vamos a ver ahora son con lentes eh, PL, anamórficos y diferentes tomas con diferentes. Bueno, hay, hay, hay uno 1.5X, el 95 milímetros. Está muy interesante. Hay que ver también lo que es como el cuánto pesa, ¿no? Cuánto pesa. Una cámara obviamente de producción cinematográfica o de broadcast también podría ser. Producción de teleserie, producción de para Netflix. Pero es el primer sensor eh, que vemos full frame 12K y con nuevo viewfinder, nuevos soportes. De, para ROTS y nuevo sistema de manejo de energía, nueva, nuevos, nuevos procesadores. Una cámara interesante que lanza hoy Blackmagic. Sin, como dije, no sabemos el precio aún, pero lo que nos contaba era que no había pensado en el precio antes de diseñar. Era un, es una cámara sin un precio preestablecido en su, en su diseño inicial, así que ahora vamos a ver, vamos a tener la sorpresa de cuál va a ser el precio. No tenemos idea. La cámara vendría, vendría a entrar en el rango más alto de la línea de cámaras de Blackmagic. Esta es la cámara tope high-end de la línea. So as you can see, this is a revolution in high-end digital film. It's been specifically designed for this. There's been no expense spared in designing it. We really wanted to break ground in new technology, new sensor design and post-production workflows. It's our dream camera. So it does mean it's quite a bit more expensive than you'd expect uh, because it's such a high-performance camera. Um, but it does come with a kit and a road case. Um, it includes the top handle and the shoulder mount. Um, it comes with a peel lens mount. It also includes a lockable EF men, um, lens mount. And it also does include a, an 8 And there's also a battery plate installed. Plus there's an AC power supply in, uh, installed as well, uh, included as well. Um, but you can change the battery plate to different battery systems if you like. So the new Blackmagic uh, Ursa Cine 12K will be priced at 14995 So we're building the initial cameras now. However, this is a very high-end camera. So we'll initially ship to a small number of select DRPs. We want to make sure we spend a few weeks checking that we've got all the software features we need. Plus all the film accessories work well. Uh, and then we'll increase production as we work with those high-end customers. Um, we also have a separate kit that includes a viewfinder. So it's uh, in a slightly larger road case and includes all the features that you get with uh, the other kit, but it includes the viewfinder and all the viewfinder mounting hardware. Plus it includes the, the USB-C cables. 
and there's two different lengths um, uh, of like options for mounting the, the viewfinder. The one we've got here plus an extension arm, uh, like a long extension arm that extends out if you want to move the viewfinder away from the camera. Now this kit is called Black Venture Ghost Cine 12K plus EVF, and the cost for this kit will be 16495. But the viewfinder can be purchased separately for 1695. Plus there's a whole lot of other accessories available for the camera, it includes battery plates and handles and grips and, and lens mounts. And all these, all these uh, accessories have been designed to match the Ursus Cine style. So it's really an amazing camera. It's just incredible to shoot with. I can't wait to take one out for myself and just you know, have some fun with it. Uh, now we've also, I mentioned just before that we built a uh, media dock for the Ursus Cine. It's very similar to a uh, Blackmagic Cloud dock, um, but those are SSDs and U.2 discs. Um, but this dock can handle three Ursus Cine media modules. So let me show you, I'll bring the product out. There it is there. Move this over a little. There it is. You can really see how nice it looks. Uh, let me check out the back and you can see how the back works. Uh, now it's quite similar to the, uh, you can get a shot there. It's quite similar to the Blackmagic Cloud dock. You get dual um, internal power supplies with redundant AC connections and the storage uh, you know, it can be the core of a whole post-production system. So you really like need those redundancy uh, power supplies to make sure it stays up. Um, you get four 10G Ethernet connections for connecting workstations. Um, normally you'd connect one to an Ethernet switch, but having four means it makes building a DOT cart much easier. Uh, and you can also connect one to the internet. Uh, and the be connected to a DaVinci front set grading. The media so mode is really the useful, lector de la media plus there's de, a USB uh, port for upgrades. And um, our Blackmagic slots. Cloud Store monitoring display output is on there as well. Y so you can see all the uh, cloud, uh, like you can see the, the storage status, which is really nice. So let me show you how it works. Backup, um, I'll bring it around here and connect some power. So you can get a, a bit of a shot of the front there. Um, you'll see uh, the media modules um, can be read by the dock when I plug the power in. So, so you can see there the fan spins up and um, it'll then start to talk to the modules. It'll quiet down, now it's booted, so it's running Blackmagic OS, so it booted really quickly, now it's gone quiet again. Um, so you can see the uh, modules will then get checked out, and then they're available over the network. So to remove a media module, they're really easy. You just click the little line there, and uh, the module comes out. In fact, what's really happening when you open that, it brings the module offline. As soon as you click that, the module goes offline and all the storage disconnects from it so that they can be pulled out safely. And then when I plug it back in again, And then just click it back in, and you'll see the lead ring illuminate as it accesses the media module. Um, so it's checking the media, mounting it over the network, and so now anyone connect to it. Um, now the lead ring is red for, oh, sorry, green for read and red for write. Um, and this media dock's really useful to have. It means the media can be accessed immediately, even no, though it's only has 10G. Um, you can plug the you know, camera into the media network module, and, you know, access all the media on it. Like this is a cloud store. Having the dock is much more practical. It makes it much easier to also to back up the modules. Um, because it's so incredibly fast. Now this new media, Blackmagic Media Dock will be priced at 1995. It's starting production, so it should be available in a few days. We also have a cover for the Blackmagic Media Module, which I'll bring out, which I might turn the camera off, there's no point wasting power. So um, it allows you to protect the media module uh, when it's in transit. Um, see it's got foam on the inside and it protects the module. Um, they cost only a few modulos dollars. Modulos de 8 terabytes um, y modulos de 16 terabytes van a estar disponibles. El de 8 uh, includes eh, unos 1,250 dólares. And we have both 8 terabytes and 16 8, 8 terabyte terabyte. versions of the media modules. In fact, the Blackmagic media module 8 terabyte will cost 1,695, and that's pretty much available now. Um, there'll also be a Blackmagic media module, uh, module 16 terabyte version that'll be available soon. However, as I mentioned, all the Ursus Cine cameras include a Blackmagic Media Module 8 terabyte with them, so you can start shooting immediately. Now, there is something else about Ursus Cine I wanted to tell you about. Um, we've been working on an even more advanced sensor. It won't be available until the end of the year, but I think it'll be, um, sort of explain what a technical advance Ursus Cine really is. So let me show you. It's, um, I'll bring it out. Here it is here. Este es otro nuevo sensor, 17, here it is. In fact, I'll get the 17K. current 12K camera sensor. So if you can get a shot there, there it is. So it's a 17K sensor, and that's the current 12K sensor for Neosim Mini Pro. Now it's a full 65mm in size, so you can see it there compared against the original sensor. And you can really see how big it is. Now it's 50.808mm uh, by 23.316mm. 
It's a similar size as a 70mm 5 per film. Así que tenemos uh, dos, dos nuevas cámaras de, de alta uh, so gama. This larger size means the sensor is 17K. Esta está Its resolution is actually 17, un poco más arriba, uh, 17. 1520 pixels by yeah. 8040 pixels. It has 16 stops of dynamic range. Um, so let me show you how uh, the camera, I'll bring it out. Here it is. Here it is there. It's called Ursus Cine 17K. I'll turn it on. So you can see it's very similar to the 12K, um, but the uh, 12K was designed to handle the 17K speed. So both yeah, of these works. models were developed at the same time. So it's pretty cool. Uh, it's got such a large sensor, um, we need some new lens mounts. Uh, so we have the LPL and the Hasselblad lens mounts. Um, and Ursa Cine were 17 k will include both. Uh, let me take off the lens so I can show you the sensor. Well, I probably should turn it back off again. Um, so take off the black box. And you can see down into the sensor. Put these sensors out here. if you get a shot down there, you can see that there. You see uh, it's a very large sensor. Now this model doesn't have ND filters built in because the sensor's so large, the filters don't fit. Otherwise the features are the same. So it's an amazing camera. Um, now it won't ship until close to the end of the year because the lead times are so long and we're still working on tweaking the software. But I think it'll be really exciting to shoot with it. Imagine if every film could be shot in IMAX style resolutions without being a complex process. And that's our dream is to make high resolution shooting really easily. Tres camera. Yeah, we're on the verge of all new viewing, viewing experience for customers. You know, I don't know why cinema still use projectors. I think they should be use high resolution LED screens. It'd be a lot better. So I think as far as cost goes, we're not exactly sure what the price of this will be yet. It'll obviously be a lot more than the 12K model, but we should know more towards the end of the year uh, what the price is. Pixel. Okay, so now I'd uh, like to come back to more portable cameras. So we have another new camera today. So recently we launched the Blackmagic Cinema Camera 6K and it was very well received. Wow. The image quality is really nice and it's very affordable. Uh, but it wasn't the only camera we were designing. The Blackmagic Cinema Camera 6K is really the sort of low cost handheld model. Um, but we were also working on another model. Um, now it's called Blackmagic Pixar 6K. Let me show you. Um, it's a box or a cube camera style. It has the same image uh, sensor and processing, color processing as the Blackmagic Cinema Camera 6K. So both cameras uh, can be used together on a shoot because they'll absolutely match perfectly. Wow. I mean, all the cameras can match really well, but mm. they're actually the same uh, sensor. Otherwise, it's actually quite a different camera internally. It's, it's very customizable. Um, it's also a full frame digital film camera, a bit in a box style design. It's got a 24 by 36 millimeter 6K sensor. Six, and includes CF an Express. optical low pass filter as standard. And the optical filter has been tuned to match the sensor. Um, so it's really ah. cool. Now it has a wide dynamic range of 30 Ambo. stops. Um, Accessorio. It has two CF Express cards for storage. It also has Ethernet, uh, so it can sync to Blackmagic Cloud. And it also records Blackmagic RAW, RAW with H.264 HD proxies. So let's have a look at some of the details. Now I have a rigged version here. So I'll move this aside and bring out the rigged one. Um, so you can see it's fully compatible with all the Ursus any accessories. Uh, so it's really cool. Uh, it has everything, uh, for high-end or low-end work. Like you can do high-end films, you can do independent films, music videos, documentaries, it's just fantastic. It's an amazing design. It's all machined actually from uh, aircraft grade uh, aluminum. That means it's really strong when you've got things mounted on it. And it has these flexible side plates for different accessories, uh, which is an incredibly adaptable design. Um, so let me show you the front. Um, so I'll remove the lens. You can see there, so you get down in there and have a look. Now it's got a great sensor. It's full frame 35 mil, open gate three by two. It uh, allows really ah. shallow depth of field. So it's got a, it's got the full height for anamorphic. But that's the right? sensor resolution oh, is uh, 6048 by 4032. So it handles a lot of different film formats. It's got the 30 Lo stops of ah, range. Different so it's the monitor, no? Tiene que... detail. It's got the color no uh, generation pan... five color science, it's which una, has got really rich la, like images. Que el monitor no... uh, plus a Camera no he escuchado qué montura tiene, no, 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 no he escuchado. Film response to color adjustments, accurate skin tones. It can shoot up to 120 frames a second when it's windowed. 
Uh, it's got two native ISO settings there, 400 and 3200. Um, and you get uh, up to 25,600 ISO. So it's even very clean when you're shooting in low light. So I'll put the lens back on. So the front has the uh, USB-C for the viewfinder. And there's also a mini XLR audio input there. I think you get a shot there uh, for phantom power. Plus you can plug, uh, it's, got, it's, a, it's a microphone input with 48 volt for phantom power. Plus you can plug a microphone in there. Um, now let's check out the other side of the camera here. You can see it's got the uh, LCD, it's got a four inch touch screen. So the camera runs Blackmagic OS. So let's use all the uh, features in Blackmagic OS. And it's the same size LCD as the OSA Mini Pro, but it's brighter. Uh, so it's, got, it's better in daylight. It even has 3D lookup tables, which also come on the monitoring out. It has a heads up display for status and record parameters, and you can touch the uh, controls to adjust them. Um, it also has a digital slide, so you can tag files with metadata for post-production. Um, but there's also a bunch of direct uh, controls on the side there uh, for all the important controls, such as a dedicated button for ISO, wipe, bounce, and shutter. Plus there's also a scroll wheel for iris adjustment, which is really useful. So the, um, an LCD is great, but all these controls can be used by feel. El caso de ver qué batería tenía, qué montura de batería, porque el problema es que hemos tenido la... Uh, and you can set those buttons up for whatever functions you like. It's all done through the menus. And of course, there's the big large red record button. Plus there's buttons for high frame rate, focus zoom, and grabbing stills and accessing the menus as well. So it's really cool. Um, actually, I'll turn it on. Switches on the back there. Um, and I can bring the menus up. Okay, see? Um, so you can see the menus. You can get a shot of that there. Now on the other side, um, we have these custom side plates there. And if I can grab uh, one of the guys could bring over the cheese plate one. Um, now the camera's designed to be rigged, so we're never really quite sure. Cool, thanks. <laughs> we were, didn't get this uh, here. So you can see you can change the side plates. And there's a, a, a riggable one. So we're never really quite sure how people are gonna use it. So we've designed a lot of flexibility in. So having these side plates, they can be changed and you can get different types of plate, but they're really simple. I mean, people can machine their own. We'll probably have the spec of it in the manual, so you can machine your own versions of them. And we have plates um, uh, with mounting points, and uh, we have a plate that holds an external disc or a phone. We also have a plate with a rosette, this one here, um, for mounting like a side handle. And we include some plates with the camera. So we'll check out the back now, if we can get another shot from there. You can see there's a wide range of connections on the back. It has USB-C on the back. That lets you record to an external disc. Um, it has uh, 12G SDI for onset monitoring. Obviously, SDI is better than HDMI because you can run the longer cable lengths, and the monitoring output has the dedicated overlays. If we can get those there. Um, there's also a sync time code and reference input, so it allows you to sync the camera on set. And there's a 1G Ethernet uh, connection, so you can access the CF Express cards, uh, and they actually look like network storage. Uh, so you can connect, uh, like you could connect DaVinci and Grade out of the camera, or you can uh, connect it to the internet and get really fast media sync to Blackmagic Cloud. Now you can plug a phone into the USB and also use mobile data. And the Ethernet supports uh, REST APIs for the camera control as well. Now, if you look there, we also have a cinema style DC power uh, connection. Um, there's also on some, uh, some connections on the other side of the battery there. So there's a three and a half mil video camera style audio input. And that's for low cost microphones. There's also a headphone jack for monitoring. Um, now we'll talk about the media. It supports two CF Express cards and they're uh, protected by these dust covers here. So it allows uh, continuous recording. So you can hot swap the cards while you're recording. CF Express is fast. It handles the 12-bit raw files from the camera, um, but you can also use the USB-C for external disks. And it includes DaVinci Resolve with the, uh, with the camera as well. Now the, the batteries are these uh, BPU series batteries. They're really common and available. They can get quite large. Uh, some of these batteries can get really big. They get longer as they get larger, so the design can handle that because they're mounted in the back like that. And you can get over three hours on the largest battery. Now the camera also includes um, a media browser on the side, um, so you can browse media and upload to Blackmagic Cloud. You can you know, sync to Blackmagic Cloud. Um, so you can share media globally with DaVinci Resolve users. It records proxies and Blackmagic RAW at the same time. So it'll sync the proxies first, and so the post-production team get the media almost instantly. Um, and you can, if you select the Black, uh, DaVinci Resolve project on the camera, you can record and essentially sync right into the bin. So as you shoot, the shots are actually arriving in the DaVinci workstations right in the bin from the editors. So that's never been possible for us. So it's really cool. It's very amazing, you know? Um, and it's constantly syncing. So even no, from multiple está, cameras. Está 
So Está muy, muy impresionante la cámara de Pixels, Tenemos nuevas baterías BPU, la misma que usábamos en Sony, la BPU, la grande. Nuevo sistema de memoria CF Express tipo B, mucho más rápido. Streaming, envío de información. Streaming.com.br/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/slash/sl
and rotate. It's pretty cool. Um, and so the gain trackball does the size and position, the gamma trackball does the rotation. So we can also adjust the power window with the trackball. So let's add a window. Um, I'll add a window there. And then I can press and hold the shift up key and use the trackballs to adjust the power window. Now the gain trackball does the size and position and the gamma trackball does the window aspect ratio and rotation. So let's do that. So I can change the shape of the, I can do the rotation. I can change the shape. And I can change the size and the position. So it's pretty cool. So it's really nice to use. And what's really exciting is it's localized. So we've actually added multiple languages. So initially we'll have English, French, Spanish, German, Italian, Portuguese, Korean, Japanese, Chinese, Vietnamese, and Thai. Um, and we'll add a few other languages after that. So let me show you one of those panels. Um, I've got a Korean one here. So you can see if you can get a bit of a shot of that, you can see an example of how it looks when it's localized. So it's a very powerful panel. Um, and you can put this slot on the back as for an iPad. So that's pretty cool too. I don't think we had an iPad. Um, so I think it'll really help freelance colorists. Um, it's so portable. So this new DaVinci Resolve micro color panel is uh, $4.95. So the English model is available now uh, and the other languages will ship in a few weeks time. Oh, we do have an iPad. Cool. Thanks. Um, so you can see I can put it in the slot here and it holds the iPad and it connects to the iPad with Bluetooth. So it's pretty cool. Okay, lastly, we have some new prices for Video Assist. Um, so recently we've been working really hard on reducing the cost of these. Uh, we have so many cameras that support Blackmagic RAW now with Video Assist, so reducing the prices will be really helpful. And then more people can use Blackmagic RAW, plus all the other great features in Video Assist, such as the monitoring and the recording and the scopes, uh, plus the focus and framing tools. So now the five inch model of the Blackmagic Video Assist 3G was 525 and now it'll be 325. The Blackmagic Video, uh, Video Assist 3G seven inch model was six, uh, sorry, 765. It'll now be 565. And the five inch 12G model was 795 and that'll be 595. And the 12G seven inch model was 995 and that'll be 795. So that's a $200 saving across all those models. I really love Video Assist, it's such a handy product. It's so useful. I mean, I use it all over the place as just a general monitor and scope, but it's fantastic with cameras, particularly the new Pixis camera. It's gonna be awesome with that. So these new prices will be online and available today. So that's about all for this update. It's, sorry, it's a bit long. Um, it's so long I was worried I might have to go and uh, stop and for a moment and have a shave. So look, I hope everyone can travel to Las Vegas and see all these new products working. We'll have them on display and, and operating. It's been very exciting working on these new technologies. It's a privilege to be able to do it. And I wanna thank everyone at Blackmagic Design for all the hard work they've done on all these new products and the software updates, because there's a lot of software updates coming. Nuevo sistema de batería, nuevo sistema de almacenamiento. Lo que habíamos pedido que era un nuevo panel de control también está. Eh, pienso que es un lanzamiento increíble. Vamos a tener muchísimas, tengo muchísimas preguntas que hacer el día lunes. Así que vamos a tratar de hacerlo mucho más condensado. Esto fue, esto fue una presentación muy extensa, muy, muy buena, muy, muy interesante. Pero vamos a tratar de ir el, el lunes al, al, al stand, al booth de Blackmagic y poderles llevar al máximo y condensado toda la información de, de Blackmagic. Eh, les agradecemos mucho habernos visto y yo voy a cerrar esto un poco por acá. La transmisión la hicimos para que ustedes sepan esto que está acá en una pantalla verde. Así que lo podemos ya cerrar. Y esto es, eh, estamos haciendo con el, el Ultimate la transmisión y luego les explico cómo hicimos esto de la pantalla verde, el monitor, todo esto. Y muchísimas gracias por seguirnos. Recuérdense que estamos a estar toda la semana en todas las fábricas. Muchísimos lanzamientos. Ya tuvimos los de DJI. Tenemos Blackmagic. Vamos a ver qué nos presenta la próxima semana también el stand de Nikon Red. ¿Okay? Así que gracias y gracias por seguirnos.